Bacteria. Marianne Thorne is a mariner, artist, educator, and ocean advocate. She has always had a great appreciation for the water, having grown up in an avid seafaring household. This led her on a path to a plethora of marine certifications and teaching experiences along the way. Her education career has taken her from island to island, guiding sailing students with Block Island Maritime Institute, advocating for marine mammals aboard while whale watching vessels in Hawaii, teaching surfing in Hawaii, teaching outdoor adventure marine science at Catalina Island Marine Institute, researching for the Nature Conservancy and captaining as an education special specialist for Save the Bay, Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island. Most recently, Mary was the program director for New England Science and Sailing in Stonington, Connecticut, a nonprofit that provided ocean adventure programming to the students from all walks of life. Putting 10,000 students on the water annually, student growth is driven by academic content including the ocean literacy principles and NGSS, as well as socio-emotional growth with skills in perseverance, communication, teamwork, and self-control. Mary is a certi certified American Red Cross lifeguard, NAUI dive master, ACA level kayak, level one kayak, coastal kayak guide, NSSIA sup and surf instructor, US sailing level one trainer, US sailing reach stem instructor, National Faculty for U.S. Sailing and U.S. Coast Guard Master 50 Grand Ton Captain. So Mary's going to be our first speaker. I'm also going to read Liz's bio because she's going to go right after Mary. Liz Sister is the supervisor of the Sailing Center at the Mystic Seaport Museum. Liz has spent the past decade working at maritime museums, leading experiential education programs both on and off the water. At the Mystic Seaport Museum, she runs both a residential and day summer camp, as well as a number of spring and fall classes, including powerboating, handling, and women's sailing classes. Before coming to the Mystic Seaport Museum, she sailed on Onrus out of Connecticut River Museum and currently serves as their relief captain. She has a dual degree in history and English from UConn and her master's in American and New England studies from the University of Maine, where she focused on New England's maritime culture. Awesome. So those are going to be our first two speakers. We're going to do it just like last time. We'll have two speakers go, a chance to have questions, a break for pizza and bathrooms, and then our next two. Sound good? Sweet. Yep. Mary, are you ready? Awesome. All right. Well, hello, Maine Mavens. Um, this is pretty cool to see you all in this room that used to be the only place that Ness offered program. Um, it had just two by fours. It had um, a greenhouse roof because it grew algae up there. But to see all of these young people and to see all you young ladies and women, and um, I just feel so privileged to chat with you today. Um, so thank you for allowing this opportunity. So I. Um, I grew up in Stonington, so it's kind of cool to hear that many of you go to Stonington High School. I started the sailing team with my brothers and a couple of friends, and, you know, we got on the water as much as possible. But if you've been to Stonington as you're, you know, at Ness right now and kind of going all around Long Island Sound, it's pretty natural to want to be on the water and to be around it. And for some people, it comes naturally where your family does it. Um, and some people, you might have to work a little bit at it and to try to figure out how do I, you know, get out on a kayak or walk the beach or something like that. So I never knew I wanted to be a captain, but when I moved to the shoreline when I was age six, my parents put me into horseback riding with my cousin and my brothers, three of them got to go to sailing lessons down in Watch Hill. And that lasted, I don't know, maybe one month of the summer and I said, wait a minute, I want to be out on the water too. So I um, jumped on board and got things switched and started sailing um, at the age of six and seven. Um, little opti dinghies, and you, you'll probably see some down at Ness. Maybe you do that yourself. But it was sort of the first step into uh, learning boating and the responsibility and the confidence that comes with being on the water. So chasing after my brothers. They were older. That's why I was chasing. My parents always put me in with them and kept me, um, you know, up with the team doing all the same stuff because we were just a big pack of family doing things. Um, but I found out very soon that being able to be on the water offered me 
a ton of freedom where I grew up. Um, we bought a 13 foot whaler and this is where I'm going to start to share some pictures. They're sort of just a collection of things. And honest, I couldn't even find pictures of when I, this time we didn't have the phones and the access at this point. So I went online to the internet and kind of piece some stuff together, but I'm going to share some content right now. Um, so you can kind of get, uh, a, the gist of what my, what I'm talking about here. Um, so are you able to see my screen right now? Uh, no, Mary. Okay, so hold on. I need to select these photos and hopefully they stay in order. Otherwise, we'll just cruise with it. Um, let's see. All right, this, it looks like it's, let me go back for a second. I guess I should have tried this part. I have a photo album that I wanted to share here. All right, we'll just do it this way. Oh, no, we'll do share screen. I can do that. Share screen. Okay. Is it working now? Um, no. Oh, no. No. I'm so sorry, everybody. Everything on the screen. Screen broadcast. Is that a button? Start broadcast. Three, two, one. Countdown. <laughs> Okay, is that better? Okay, here we go. Locked and loaded. So this was kind of funny. Um, can you see this? This was like, literally, I Googled 13 foot whaler and this is what came up. This is not me, but this is what my first boating experience was where I was 11 and I got my boating license and I was allowed to just cruise and go free and fast on the waters. As long as I wore my life jacket, we were allowed to go out on the water. And um, it was funny. My mom always knew when we were, were wearing our life jackets and I never really thought about it too much until all of a sudden I realized she had a really good pair of binoculars up at the house so she could literally see us. And we just thought she was like magical at this. But we started off in this 13 foot whaler and we took the safe boating course down at the local Sonyton Como bunch of questions, but really it became practice on the water with my family um, and specifically my mother. Um, we'd go down to Sandy Point Beach, which hopefully you guys will get access to at some point, and we'd go just explore. This soon led into like, whoa, I can get a license. I can get something that says I can be safe on the water. I'm legally allowed to go on the water. And it became distinguishing from my friends and from different people. And I went, this is just awesome. So I then went on when I was um, 18 to get my first limited master's captain's license. And these are um, old port launches that are in many different harbors around New England. Um, and they're basically a water taxi. And what you do is you go pick up people at their boats on the moorings or the permanent anchors in the coves, and you um, carry them safely from their boat to the dock and they pay a small fee okay. to the company. So this was um, my first kind of like real career-based job in the industry after teaching sailing a little bit and junior instructing, um, but it allowed me go out to, to go out to Block Island. I lived at the Coast Guard station, which is the lighthouse out there, and on a tall ship called the Black Pearl, and I became a launch driver, which was I'm in charge of up to 26 passengers on this boat, and I get to meet all of these cool people cruising around um, New England, and they remember me because I'm caring for them and caring for their boats safely. Um, and it became just so fun. So I did that for seven different summers, and I took the launch um, operators course to do that, which was an upgrade from the safety um, course. So that's the first commercial license that you can get is the limited launch operators um, license. So we had a cool old one named Echo, and in maybe one seven hour shift, I would uh, transport 300 or 400 people to and from their boats on a busy day, like in Black Island. It was exhausting. It was so fun and it was challenging because it's not all on beautiful days like this. It's on different condition days. And often more people took the boat when the weather was really challenging. So I'd have to figure out how to maneuver my boat safely to their boat. We would then take students out on the boats for tours and I started to learn a little bit about the ecological history and the biology of the different systems. So it became really fun 
um, to then start to use the license towards education. So then I was like, this is just the best. I wanna do more education. And I uh, went to the Mystic Seaport and became the, to get on this boat, the Brilliant, a 71 foot schooner, I uh, offered to be the galley cook for 18 passengers aboard on 10 day trips, which was a totally new skill set. So I was like, I want to be on this boat so bad. I want to cruise in a different sort of situation and continue to gather sea time. So I hopped on board and sailed Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Cuddy Hunk, Block Island, and it was a wonderful time. So then I wanted to go out and do more. I happened to have an aunt who lived out in Hawaii. So I was like, I got to gather more sea time. I want to keep working on boats. Um, so I went out to Hawaii on the big island and was able to work as a crew of this boat, but we also did whale watching tours. It was really interesting because some people came to understand the biology and some people came for pina coladas and lava flows that we would have to sort of swim out to them after. But the point is, is as I was working on these different boats, I was gathering sea time and experience in different conditions and in different locations around the world which is a really important part about being becoming a captain and being a captain as you grow. So we had some cool crew and it was fun to be part of the body glove team. I also was part of the captain Zodiac team where this was a little bit more of an adventurous system um, where we would pop our people in the water and um, teach them to snorkel. So I went, hold on, now we're on these power boats, but we're putting people in the water. What are the differences in keeping people safe when you're moving them off your boat into the water um, and then back on? So there's some different things you would learn. Different style boat, a hard bottom with um, soft inflatable tubes on the side. Really fast, really adventurous, really cool to see sea life, which I was able to, um, through this experience, swim with a whale shark, which was incredible. By working as crew on this boat, I then was able to have this experience of swimming with a whale shark, which is probably one of the highlights of my life. So as I hopped from island to island, Block Island, Rhode Island, out to Hawaii, uh, the big island, I then got a little bit closer to Catalina Island. And Catalina Island is um, a large conservation land, except for a small town of Avalon. And they have camps just like nests all over the island. But as you can see, the cove over here is where people live. And then the rest of the island is pretty natural habitat. So the only way in and out is by boat. And it means that you absolutely have to have um, some pretty good maritime skills and ocean skills to be there. So as a captain already, I was pretty ideal candidate to do captain stuff and also education. Um, and it was incredible being out there. We would have 250 students come on this really large boat and then we would take them snorkeling and kayaking and out on these very small education vessels to go look at dolphin and sea slugs, this really weird, big, squishy mollusk. That's a slug right there that lives in the ocean. Um, and this program out in Catalina also had a tall ship, 171 foot, um, tall ship right here that we were allowed to go on and it allowed us to work for a couple weeks. I didn't work full time for them, but I was very interested in going and gathering more sea time. It allowed us to sail the rest of the Channel Islands. So we would go and volunteer as crew and then we'd get to go sail to Santa Barbara um, and some of the other islands there. So my, as I'm going along, it, this is where it sort of just becomes a path to gather more experience, fill your database of what boat can I get on what experience can I provide and what can I add to my resume of boating and um, maritime knowledge? So moving back to the East Coast, that was a bit challenging. I was out in Catalina for three years and then I moved back to our, um, back because I missed my family and my home. And I began working for Save the Bay, which operates almost full year on the water. And they had this opportunity for a captain to run um, their education vessel, the Alita Morris, in this big aluminum boat right here that carried 35 passengers. And so this was probably the largest boat that I was in charge of at this point. But with all the other experience I had gathered, my license was allowing me 
um, to, to take that next step and to be the per be not just crew, but to be the operator of the boat. So we would do seal tours out of Newport, um, Rhode Island and also uh, Providence. This is probably my first day. And as you can see, I look pretty young and people did not look at me as the captain. In fact, as I would you know, welcome people aboard, I'd say, welcome aboard, welcome aboard. And I'd show them where to sit. And then some of them would go, where's the captain? And I got kind of tired of that question. So I basically said, I don't know, where is the captain? And then I went, just kidding, it's me. So I started kind of having fun with breaking the stereotype. Um, sometimes people would come up and I'd go, it's my first day, I'm so excited. Uh, which made some people a little bit nervous, but it also broke um, broke down some of the barrier of some, some people that sort of just didn't see me as the person who could be in charge of that vessel safely. Um, I did have to use a little like box to stand on because it wasn't built for a 5-4 person, but I operated the heck out of that boat and had so much fun working with students and um, doing the SEAL tours. So as time sort of went, I moved more into education and took some time to do some different stuff, less operating as a captain and more working with the Nature Conservancy on different research projects and advocacy. And I started to think about how my boating um, aspirations would fit into the family. And so this is my dad's boat. And he was at the point where he was doing some larger trips down the intercoastal waterway and offshore. So I started to help him. And it was a point which was really empowering for me in my life where my father looked at me for knowledge and for experience to help um, on these large adventures that we did. So we would go off for two weeks and deliver the boat from Florida to the Bahamas and down a certain point. And we would work together to navigate challenging weather conditions and also um, different ports that we had never been in and different countries that we had never been in. So it was really quite awesome. And with my mom, this is a wild picture here, but this is really indicative of my mom is also um, an amazing role model for me where she has provided, um, you know, just fearlessness of being out there and she loves to scallop. So we wrapped up my very, very silly dog and went up scalloping and learned how to kind of work the boat in shallow waters to harvest food. My dad had a mooring service business. So we learned to operate the barge and to kind of service the moorings. If we did not take these in and out for the season, they would float away and that would be very expensive. So you learn to gather experience on different boats again. Um, and they all handle differently and they all have different conditions. So it's just filling that database of how do I operate safely? Even tiny little boats, you find yourself learning how to maneuver and put boats on cars and transport them on land to then get to different places. So this is a funny one as I, I know I'm, I have like two more minutes here and then I'll wrap it up. Um, this is a funny one is as a boat captain who had experienced sailing, I was allowed to work on a movie set with Naomi Watts because this is a very specific sailboat known as an international canoe. And my friend had this and people didn't know how to sail it. So I had to work with the actors to sail this. So I was an extra stunt double for this little funny little boat in Long Island. Just, it's a funny world and where it takes you, I could have never picked that. But my favorite experiences are working with students specifically at Ness. I feel like it was defining in my life to empower all sorts of young people and young women boats of all kinds, kayaks, cardboard boats, different buoyancy, doing powerboat licensing, sailing, and um, meeting different people. This is Joe Courtney right here. He's our state representative. And we invited him to sail with us to say all of this good stuff happens out on the water in your area. And it allowed me the opportunity to become an advocate down in Washington, DC saying, we need to protect our waters and make sure our students can sail and our students can powerboat and our students can snorkel and understand our ecosystems. So he came multiple times and I had a great relationship with um, the representatives. And then there's Nessie, which was a cool opportunity at Ness, um, which we got to design a boat that would be good for the area and good for research. 
I was able to go with the America's Cup because I was able to do both power boating education and sailing. And that's a unique skill set that you can gain in your experience with Ness in the Marine Mavens program. And if you really like it, you can continue it. And then designing, this is my artistic thing, 11th hour racing had, an, um, you have to create cool boats. So I've offered the chance to kind of design a pattern. It was not selected, but it's fun to think of how you can bring art and life to your boats. So, I mean, I guess the point in showing you all of this stuff was that um, you don't really know where it's gonna take you, um, where power boat, where you're power boating, or you might not ever say, I, I want my captain's license or what it's gonna do for you. But for me, it offered just a chance of freedom and exploration that I didn't even know when I started that journey. And even to this day, um, my journey with being a captain is with um, being in this adventure and this excitement and this exploration and with my family now. And that's something that I hope, um, I hope you guys like take advantage of that, like go for it. That's it. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Some, some tidbits that I know Mary um, tricked her and I in the back. We're just like, what? We didn't know that. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but we're going to do so. Save your questions. If you have questions, we're going to go to Liz next. Hey, Liz, how's it going? Hi. Okay. All right. Let me pull up. Uh, I got PowerPoint. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. Does everyone see that okay? Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and talk to you guys. Um, I think the Marine Maven is such a cool program you guys are doing. Um, I'm super excited um, for the opportunities you get to have. Um, so uh, I did not grow up sailing. I didn't step into a sailboat until I think I was 19. I was in college. So I went, I, I lived local. I grew up in the area, but I'd never been out in the water. I didn't, my parents didn't, boat. Um, so uh, I went to Yukon Avery Point, which was all waterfront, which was super exciting. And one of my main goals was to get out on a boat at some point. Um, so I took a little like intro to sailing or intro to boating class, a little one credit, uh, like almost like a gym credit. Um, and that's when I learned how to sail. Um, at the end, sort of near the end of my undergrad career, I did this uh, study abroad on USS Niagara as part of uh, maritime studies approach to um, a study abroad. It wasn't really abroad anywhere. We stopped in Canada like once, um, but we got to spend a whole month on a tall ship, uh, learning how to sail it, learning how to be crew, um, learning about the environment of the lakes. Um, it was out on Lake Erie. Um, so that was the sort of most defining moment um, that set me out on what I wanted to do. Uh, I had gone into college thinking that maybe I'd want to be a teacher. Um, I had gone in pre-education, done a bunch of history and English classes. It wasn't really until I did this study abroad and a couple of the internships that I did uh, in the following years that I wanted, I knew I wanted to do something with museums. Um, but I wasn't really sure exactly what I wanted to do with museums. Um, so when I was looking at what to do next, what to do after grad school, I found this program up in Maine called the American and New England Studies, and they had a track with museums and public culture. Um, so really what I was doing at the end of my college career into grad school, I was doing a ton of internships. I got on a bunch of um, Let's see, where did I, I went to Mystic Seaport Museum for an internship. Uh, I went to the US Coast Guard Museum. Uh, I entered at Connecticut River Museum twice. And I also did an independent study with the Mashantucket Pequot Museum. Um, so this gave me a huge, um, like really great perspective on the museum industry as a whole. And I worked with so many different people and departments at a variety of different museums. Um, when I graduated from the program up in Maine, I got a job at the Connecticut River Museum. Uh, it was only a little part-time job. It was actually a development associate 
associate job and it was a three-year grant funded position so i worked in an office for a little bit and then i used my other time at the museum to go sailing they had a boat at the time the pictures on the right of uh, mary e the schooner was privately owned but sailed off of their dock so i jumped on board as crew and i did as many trips as i could sailing with them day trips uh, a couple hours at a time taking out passengers um, when that boat was sold a few years later i was still working at the river museum at that time and i got to take it up to maine which was a really cool trip it was very cold i think it we did it in april maine in april is very cold um and then the the museum brought in the on rust which is the pictures on the left there um, it's a replica of a Dutch ship from 1614, very weird traditional rig. Um, and I spent a lot of time working on there, as well as when the um, grant funded position ended, I spent that following summer uh, entirely just working on Onrust. I was at the time licensed during my you know part time gig at the Connecticut Room Museum, I focused on getting my captain's license during that time. I got, um, I, I tried to sail as much as I could. I took the class actually at Ness to get my captain's license, um, thinking that I would be able to take out the kids for summer camp in the, in the small whalers. We would take the kids across the river over to Knot Island, uh, do some uh, marine science out in the river and I also got it thinking that maybe one day I would drive the schooner. Um, so by the time I was mate for summer on Onrust, I was licensed and it was really valuable because the full time captain um, was there the whole summer, but let me basically run the boat um, as much as possible. So I gained a lot of experience that summer. Um, also sort of at the same time that I was doing all of this at the River Museum, I was doing a lot of um, just recreational sailing. So these are a bunch of photos from a boat I used to sail on, Zigzag Zoom, in uh, the Mudheads Wednesday night series, weekend events. Um, and we had a goal, I think it was way back, it was like 2016 or something like that, where we wanted to do a race with an all-female crew. Uh, and we we ended up doing it. It was a little messy. Uh, we had, you know, I'd never driven a sailboat, race a sailboat that big. I was more comfortable with a lot of the smaller dinghies, um, but we've sort of come back almost every year to do this kind of race and we've gotten a lot better at it and we've done a lot better in the, in the last few years. Um, and now we, we're, the, we're crew on a J24, the owner downsized a little bit and that, that boat has been um, sort of known in our little sailing circle as the, the boat with the female crew. Um, Earlier on, we got we would get some real really weird looks. Um, people would be looking for, you know, I think they were looking for who was in charge on board. Um, it was definitely um, sort of a fun experience, and a boat full of women definitely act different, communicate different than um, a boat full of men. It was just a definitely a really cool different experience. Um, I was also. Uh, I bought a couple boats. Um, I have a JY-15 and a laser. So I was doing frostbite yacht club racing over in Essex um, and a couple other little races and just cruising around in my laser. Um, I'm still involved with the frostbite yacht club and I still race my JY. I've since sold my laser. Um, and I also got on a boat that was gonna do some more ocean racing kind of through friends of a friend. Um, we were setting up to race the Bermuda race of 2020, but that obviously didn't happen. So um, we're gearing up this spring to race Bermuda in June, which I'm really excited to do. Um, we got, all right. So after my summer on Onrust, um, I was looking for a full-time gig because I was sort of coming to the end of my employment at the River Museum. Um, I was very fortunate to get a job at um, Mystic Seaport uh, as the director of the Joseph Conrad overnight camp. And I was sort of, I had a full summer, actually a full year of normal pre-COVID stuff. Obviously when COVID hit, everything sort of changed. 
Um, there was a lot of layoffs. I was laid off for about a couple months and then brought back as the sailing, the supervisor of the sailing center. Um, so we went from having like four full-time people running everything um, sailing wise to just me now. Um, and so it's been, it's been definitely difficult and a lot of work, um, but I've learned a lot while working here. I've, I've done a lot of maintenance in the winter. I've learned how to fiberglass and do some minor woodworking and we've implemented so many new programs. And I've also had opportunities to um, do programs on whale boats, go rowing like on whale boats next to the Charles W. Morgan. It's been such a sort of cool experience to be at such a historic place and be able to have access to these weird little boats. Um, I've also had access to a bunch of different types of boats at the museum as well. Um, you can't really see it at the bottom too much, but there's a boat called Liberty. It's a big giant like launch type. Uh, it's PT launch boat. It carries about 50 people. Um, I'm on their like relief captain list whenever they need someone or um, they're desperate for someone like a charter or something, they can call me. Um, and I've done the, a few of those. Uh, and really cool, I was a pro part of moving Morgan. She was hauled out last year. So I was on the, the Liberty team to, to help tow the Morgan out of her berth into the ship lift. And then a few months later out of the ship lift into her, her berth again. Um, and that was really neat moving such a large boat in such a small river. Um, I've also had opportunities to jump on Amistad, which is the middle picture, um, and obviously go back to the Connecticut River Museum where I'm um, still relief captaining for them whenever I get, uh, get some free time on Onrus. And they also just purchased uh, the boat River Quest, which is a 65-ish foot uh, pontoon boat that they do environmental stuff on. Um, and then I've also sort of gotten this um, other sort of side gig at the Essex Island Marina, which is um, driving their ferry. It's actually more of a little like launch uh, pontoon boat, which is in the upper left. It's uh, just a little six person launch that spans like a hundred feet. <laughs> it's the smallest ferry ever. Um, and I, I would get a lot of comments the, the, about being a female captain there my first week there. Um, it was like almost everyone that owned boats on the island would come through and they're like, ah, I've heard there's a female driving a boat now. So it was, it was a really funny um, that I just got, I, I was surprised I got so many comments. Um, all right, and then that's about it. Um, one more slide, since you guys are marine mavens and we are um, at the museum sort of starting a Girl Scout troop. Um, Sarah Armour, who is the new captain of Brilliant, is uh, with me. We're starting a Mariner troop through Girl Scouts. We're doing a couple information sessions this month and hoping to meet each month throughout the year to do um, Bodhi things. Everything from first aid classes to um, sailing and navigation and going on brilliant and learning historic maritime trades. So if you're all interested, this is my little promo, super excited for this program that's coming up. And um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Liz. Um, we're gonna open it up for questions. I have any questions for Mary and Liz off the bat, anything that piqued your interest that they said, maybe you wanna hear more about, have them elaborate on a story. Don't be shy. We're gonna have three months together, so. <laughs> I wanna hear about Marianne's experience as an extra. <laughs> your, your Hollywood experience. Gosh, it was so ridiculous. I mean, it was my friend's boat and I was, I don't know, 19. And I, I was told just go on the ferry from New London to Long Island, drive down to this marina where I think Billy Joel kept his boat or something. And then um, your job is to be there and to rig the boat and to help with the sailing. And apparently the actors had been doing 
sailing lessons, but that boat is not easy. That boat, you can't sit inside. It's got this funny leeboard thing. And um, they said, Naomi Watts couldn't be there for the day. So you're going to have to sit in her position. And I was, um, it ended up being, I didn't even know what the movie was about. The movie ended up being a horror movie. And so I was sitting there with Naomi, like pretending to be Naomi Watts and they're like, pretend like you're tied up, like your feet and your hands. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I can't be tied up and I can't leave these sailors sailing this boat on their own. Like they don't, they're, no, this isn't working this way. And so, and they're like, no, no, pretend and sit right there. And there's like a big movie camera on this tiny boat. And then these two actors and they're doing this end final thing that even to this day, it still haunts me a little bit. But what a gem of a like, you know, two truths and a lie or something like that. I mean, that's a forever thing that I get to be like, look at this weird thing I did because I knew this funny sailboat and this person. But um, yeah, I mean, it was just wacky. I saw the movie. I don't recommend it. It's terrifying. And um, I do recommend the sailboat, though. Really cool, old school sailboat, international canoe thing. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. What's the movie called? <laughs> oh no, I don't even want to let you see it. It's called I, I want to like tell you a fake one, but I'll tell you the truth. It's called Funny Games. Okay. Funny games? Yeah, it's called Funny Games. <laughs> Then and so, and so like it was days and days and days and weeks of the sailing, but the portion is only at the very end of sailing. So it's like it's got zero to do with sailing except for the very very end of it, which I just couldn't believe how much effort they put in in a movie set. I mean, it's mind boggling. I hope you all get to do something with the movies at some point because it's weird and it's kind of awesome, but not horror movies. <laughs> yes, I have a question. Yeah. Did you always want to work in like a lot of different places or did you ever want to work in like the same place? Um, Liz, do you want to take that one? Um, sure. So I've always like stayed sort of local. Um, I've sort of been tempted occasionally by going, you know, maybe sailing in a tropical location, but I really love uh, New England. I would say I focused a lot of it on it during my studies, but um, I feel very safe here. I know the, know the history and know the people and um, very like, I love this area. So um, I'll probably stay here. <laughs> I think that for me, you know, boating, there, there are no like roads, you can just keep going. And so I think once I started adventuring from my house and then down to Watch Hill and then out to Block Island, it seemed like, oh my gosh, there are so many other places that I, I can go and this is a way to get there. And on the side, I was studying math. I was a math major. I mean, who would have figured on that one? And I don't regret it, but at this point, I probably, I mean, looking back, I should have studied, you know, biology and marine biology and stuff, but it just, I was a math major and I studied biology thinking I was gonna track towards medicine but I kept adventuring and doing things on the water. And it created an interesting dialogue with my parents and my family, actually. My brothers used to joke and they're like, what are you gonna go do, pet more oysters or you know, go play with the dolphins? And you know, it took a very kind of serious point when I was maybe 22 years old that I said, no, this is something I'm doing and it is a career. And it is something that um, I feel really strongly has changed my life. And I, I look at Ness and I see, you know, Sydney there and I see Sarah Warren, I see how it changes people's lives. And, you know, you're gonna get to meet Rachel later and I'm sure um, there's lots of other people that you are gonna meet through this Marine Mavens program. It becomes, it's like, it's a lifestyle change. It's, it's something you do and you just kind of gather more information and just continue going on that journey. And it might be your family that you're doing it with, or it might be for a career or a job. And that's what's cool about it. And there's a lot more opportunity now, actually. I feel like there is loads of opportunity with ocean exploration, 
Rachel is probably going to talk a lot about that. Um, and just the wave, I mean, with the wind turbines being built and with ocean advocacy and underwater exploration, and there's so much happening with the ocean that the there, there's just so many more opportunities and so many more women mentors that will help you get there, but you can do it on your own the, with the way it is now. I mean, it's, it's ready for young people who are passionate about making it happen. Well, on today's International Women's Day, so what, what are your thoughts on breaking down the gender barriers that you all have faced you know, in your seafaring career or personal experiences. And I think for these mavens to just know that, you know, anything's a possibility in that industry. Yeah, I think um, I, I've definitely been very privileged in the fact that I've always been on boats and been somewhere with uh, very strong female um, leadership. So I, um, I don't know. I, I feel like I definitely really, definitely didn't really hit barriers. Um, so, but I know they're out there, but I've always been, I think, very fortunate to work with places that uh, promote women and, and work well with women. I hit barriers from my brothers telling me you can't do it as good as I can, you know, step one. I had conversations about my career of you know, is being a female, if, if I was a male, they probably wouldn't have second guessed me as being a female captain or a captain, but they did and people did. And um, honest, some of the situations working on the boats as the boats I worked on were small enough that I didn't have crew often working on the boats and carrying passengers that were males. That was a challenge for me sometimes, especially on Block Island with kind of the, oh, the party culture that can happen there. And I was working, I, I stopped working night shifts at some point because picking up these men at the end of the night and being the only person on the boat, it did make me nervous a couple of times. I handled it and I had situ I had methods of which I could work it out, but um, it, it definitely, it's, it still exists. Um, I mean, things like that exist everywhere, but it, if you're in charge of the boat, your safety is absolutely as important as their safety. So it's not them first, it's the whole boat safety. So I had to learn that I didn't have to move anybody from point A to point A, point B, if I wasn't comfortable and I could refuse taking them because my safety was equally as important or more important to me maybe. <laughs> For both of you guys, do you have one certification or one thing that you did that would be your like nugget of advice for our mavens? Like, oh, this was something that was essential for me that kind of launched me into my um, lifestyle of being on the water. One, one thing maybe that when you were in high school or a little bit older than high school, you did that kind of helped you on your track today. Um, I think my very first like boat certification, the, the one through like state, uh, state of Connecticut DEP, the safe boating license was definitely my first step to being on the water. Um, and then of course, shortly after that career wise, I think definitely the captain's license um, made it sort of more of a, a career rather than just a hobby. I totally agree that when I was 11 and I got my first card, it was like, they didn't even have good laminating machines at that point. So it was like a card that was partially half handwritten and it just gave me so much freedom. But what I can say about certifications is that um, you learn a lot of information and it allows you to do certain things legally, but it comes with a great deal of responsibility and it, it does not mean you are ready for every situation that you can say yes to. And that's where you have to use the knowledge you have, the background, and knowing that the ocean is unpredictable and boats are, they have flaws and mechanical issues and accidents do happen. 
So you have to absolutely like know that your license allows you to legally do things and it prepares you with some knowledge, but you have to walk onto every boat as if it's a learning experience and take the information that you have gained in your database of, of weather and boat size and buoyancy and people and countries. And you have to apply that to, am I able to do this right now and to do this safely with the people I'm operating with? And it's a great deal of responsibility. So I would say I have, you know, collected a ton of certifications, but it's not like a, oh, I'm done now. It's a, you're always learning. You're always gathering more experience and you're always, you know, you operating with a great deal of respect. Our pieces delayed, but I'll go ahead and introduce Sydney Plays, um, and then I'll run over and hopefully the pieces here by end. Sydney graduated from the Massachusetts Maritime Academy in 2021 with a BS in Marine Safety Science and Environmental Protection. Prior to her formal education career, Sydney was a student at NEST. She became a summer educator for the past few years. Directly following graduation, she entered the Master's in Environmental Science and Management program at the University of Rhode Island. While completing this program in the Wetland, Watershed, and Ecosystem Science track, she is also pursuing a graduate certificate in aquaculture and fisheries. During her studies, Sydney has managed to further obtain achievements such as her practice license, as a motor dive certification, and her oil spill first responder training certificate. This semester, Sydney has additionally been hired as a fellow at the Coastal Resources Center of Rhode Island, where she's working on various aquaculture and fishery projects around the state. After graduation, she hopes to continue her work in environmental education, bridging the gap between science and stakeholders. Hello. <laughs> there you go. I just want to say thank you to Mary and Liz again. I know Mary might have to hop off, so I just want to say thank you again. Give the baby a hug. <laughs> yeah, we've got the youngest Mary <laughs> made in here. <laughs> that was nice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for um, sharing, and thank you, Liz. Um, yeah, thank, thank you very much. Of course. And if it's okay with you guys, would it would you be okay with us sharing your emails um, to the Mavens if they have any questions about anything? Go yeah, on. absolutely. Awesome. All right, and then Mary, can I'll read Rachel's too. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have Sydney yeah, the last because she's in person. Okay. Great. Right. Rachel Zoe Miller is an expedition scientist, inventor, National Geographic explorer, and explorers club fellow working to protect the ocean. She is the founder of the Rosalia Project for a Clean Ocean, a nonprofit working on the problem of marine debris and the co-inventor of the Cora Ball, the world's first microfiber catching laundry ball. Rachel leads teams on expedition whose scientific results are published in peer-reviewed journals and education programs that inspire thousands of people of all ages. She's presented at venues worldwide, including the TEDx stage and at the Explorers Club. Rachel captains the 60-foot sailing research vessel, American Promise, certified hundreds of people to be sailing instructors, trained Navy SEALs to find unexploded mines using water, underwater robots, pitched to audiences at Our Ocean and Plastics Europe, and mentors young scientists at the New York Harbor School. She lives in Vermont, loves the snow as much as the sea, and does her best thinking on skis, bikes, and paddle boards. Awesome. So we're gonna start off with Rachel. So when you're ready to rock, welcome. Great, thank you. I really appreciate being here. It was a little bit of a, an echo, I'm not sure. I really appreciate the chance to get to talk to you all. I've always been a big fan of Ness. Mary knows that. And uh, God, even did some partnership programs ages ago, but yeah, really appreciate it and completely enjoyed listening to uh, Marianne and Liz. So I'll share with you as well some slides and that way you can see some of my path. Okay, there should be a old picture of me and a rainbow, Rachel's rainbow. Can you see that? Yep, we got it. 
Okay. So my path to this panel started in this homemade wooden, this is like, you couldn't technically even call it an optimist, but this preceded the fiberglass optimists. I grew up in upstate New York, Saratoga, so lakes and rivers, but mostly Saratoga Lake, this kind of two by four lake uh, up there. Is really quite beautiful. Uh, my dad was a sailor and he liked to race and there's a sailing club, the Saratoga Lake Sailing Club. So my first boat was this one, Rachel's Rainbow. And I won my first regatta. I was a competitive little kid and that pretty much set me on the path. Um, before I talk about kind of the bigger picture and moving through, I will say one thing that I really have never known what I wanted to be. I wasn't a kid who was just like single-minded on a path to save the ocean or anything like that. All I knew is that I was a water person. I could trip over my own feet on land, unless I have skis on them. I consider that a water sport. But I was a water, I am completely a water person. So I knew of my love for the water, fresh and salt in whatever form it came in, mostly through sports, swimming as a competitive swimmer and sailing. And like I said, I consider skiing a water sport. And that I find equal amounts of joy in art and science. And for people who feel that way, you may know that it's hard to make decisions in a kind of normal world when everybody kind of wants you to go into science or go into art. Uh, so having a kind of equal love, uh, it'll explain <laughs> how I got to where I am, I have to say. It allowed me to be interested in a lot of things. Anyway, so this is where my, my kind of world on the water and, and in some ways becoming a captain started as a single-handed sailor in a homemade wooden pram. I went on to start racing sailboats, lasers. You saw a laser, I'm pretty sure, and pictures before. Uh, so I raced, my dad raced his laser, I raced mine. My mom was race committee, my brother had no interest, so the three of us would cruise around. Uh, eventually, I sailed for the Brown University sailing team. That was double-handed. But I did do an Olympic campaign in the Europe dinghy, which is the was the women's single-handed Olympic class boat. So I did not make the Olympics. I um, just not obsessive enough to be truly elite. Uh, I wanted to also go skiing and um, do some other things, and that is not how one makes an Olympic team or or better. Um, but I certainly picked up a lot of really important skills during that. Um, during that time. And then just a little bit more on the sort of education. And uh, I went to Brown University, well, I went to University of Rochester in Rochester, New York first, and I swam for them and did, didn't really know what I wanted to study. Like I said, the whole equal thing made it difficult. And all I knew when I started college is that I wanted to go on the Sea Education Association Sea Semester. That's pretty much all I, I didn't wanna go into uh, med medicine and I didn't, and, then, and I wanted to do SEA. And so I arranged to do that in my sophomore year, the second half of my sophomore year. And that really was a big experience for me. I don't have a picture of that, but uh, that was on the westward. So another tall ship so far, that's been a unifying factor, which I think is really interesting about our stories so far. Um, and it was spectacular. It, it combined science for me and art and ocean. And it was, it was pretty amazing. I realized that I wanted to be on a sailing team. Rochester didn't have it. And I wanted a little bit more breadth in my academic options, which Rochester didn't have, although Rochester was a great school. So I arranged to go on two more semesters abroad to like figure it out. That was my plan. I will figure out my future by first going to Australia uh, with School for International Training to study Great Barrier Reef ecology and rainforest ecology and Aboriginal Islander culture. And then I wanted, then I was gonna to apply to Brown and Cornell, Brown to go into art, semiotics and be on the sailing team. Semiotics is the study of signs. And this path in my mind would lead me towards kind of advertising and a more art oriented path. And then I applied to, was going to apply to Cornell 
because as a New York state resident, if I got in and this is the path I took, I could go into their marine sciences program with state tuition. So it was a little idealistic in retrospect, but um, I called Brown and I was like, I want to apply mid-year. And they said, you can't do that. And so I had very understanding, although somewhat confused parents, but I was able to convince them to let me go on another semester abroad to like continue to figure it out. Uh, and went on a school for field studies semester studying is great science, this one. Uh, marine mammal biology and conservation in La Paz, Mexico. And it was amazing. We slept on the beach, like without a building, there was a building option, but we slept on the beach for three months. And um, I had a moment swimming with a humpback whale that came up to us after while we were in the water off of Cabo San Lucas. And it was pretty spectacular. Uh, and it did what I wanted. Uh, this hands-on opportunity to kind of choose. Interestingly, I found out that in that case, science depends, like successful science depends on the strict repetition of procedures. I kind of knew that, but living it was something different. And I was afraid that I really just mostly liked the development of the project in the first place and then the analysis of the results. But the every day, even if it was sitting on a rock outside looking at sea lions, but for me, every day recording sea lion behavior and that kind of thing, it wasn't variety. There wasn't enough variety. And so thank goodness I got into Brown. I chose the art semiotic route, but I'm, I'm making this story a little bit too long. But the point is for me, the hands on opportunities helped me make a decision. And then I still didn't exactly go into what I thought I would. So I went to Brown, ended up graduating with underwater archaeology. So a little bit of a veer. Incredibly, I realized that underwater archaeology was art and science. And that was pretty awesome. But when I came out, I did an Olympic campaign in sailing. So that led to running the Community Sailing Center. And like Mary, I had the amazing opportunity to be part of U.S. Sailing's leadership with national faculty and um, training committee and stuff like that. But I'm going to fast forward. So fast forward to my first captain's reason to get a captain's license. And it was to be the captain of this. This is a boat called a Penga. Uh, it's in Burlington. And the reason I got my first my captain's license in the first place was to do two things. It was to take kids on what we called adrenaline water sports camp activities. We were teaching windsurfing and um, like swimming and navigation. And we also used an ROV, which is a remotely operated vehicle. I have a picture of it coming up to explore shipwrecks. So um, that was pretty awesome. I was also teaching kite surfing and snow kiting in the winter. So lots of ways to connect people to the water. Uh, so this is my first, and, and what I did here is that's me driving. I would uh, take the boat out, like greet the guests, take the boat out, tell them the story of the shipwreck, put the ROV together and introduce everybody to the ROV and then launch it, fly the ROV down. You see kind of a big screen in front of me like a big sunlight readable uh, screen and everything the ROV could see, we could see on that screen. So uh, we'd explore shipwreck. There's a whole bunch in Lake Champlain, which is pretty cool. And then bring people back. So it was like a one, I, was, I did all the jobs. All right. That was not going to be my permanent. I knew that wasn't my forever work, even though it was fascinating. It's a good lesson. And uh, you can have a great product, but not a good business. There weren't enough people in Burlington or there wasn't enough wind for the water, for the kite surfing and things like that. And so about 11 years ago, we had a moment where uh, kind of everything came together. And that was the start of Rosalia Project for a Clean Ocean. It's named after my great grandmother, also for whom I am named with the R's. And Rosalia Project, it's a nonprofit and our mission is to protect the ocean. And we've been working on the problem of marine debris all this time. We use four strategies. So we do data cleanups. We pre do prevention through education programs. We are embracers of innovation and technology and do solutions-based research. Uh, like you heard before, we even got to invent a thing. This goes in your laundry to help collect microfiber before it can flow out the drain. That's a Coraball. 
We work surface to sea floor. So of course you can get on the shoreline and do marine debris work, but we have a boat, which I'll get to. And so that's a refrigerator that we're picking up. And this is Hector the Collector, our ROV. Um, he's pretty spectacular. And Mary, you'll be happy to see Hector is in the water off Catalina. We were on the Tolly Moor at the time. That was taken. We do our work very specifically in urban and coastal waters because that's where most of the marine debris comes from. And we have some great partnerships and it met just amazing people. But I'll quick get to the boat. That boat that you just saw, that one, is actually, it, it was built by this guy. He's really happy. You all agree that looks like a really happy guy? He is happy because he just sailed around the world alone without stopping in world record time. So alone around the world, he just broke the record. First American to ever do a solo circumnavigation. He did it on American Promise and we are her third owners. So here we are, that's me on the helm. Uh, this is while I was serving as her captain and was all your project director. And we lined everyone up, even though it's a research vessel, we were kind of feeling racy at the time <laughs> off, of, uh, off of Massachusetts or off, that's off like Beverly or somewhere. Uh, and it's a pretty special boat. We turned her into an oceanographic research vessel. And as her captain, I've learned so, so much. I worked my way up into it because as you saw, I was pretty much a dinghy sailor. And um, like Liz, really all I'd sailed as far as big boats go before that was I was the helm of an all women's J24 crew uh, team. But one thing that I really made a point to do was all the jobs. So everything from cleaning the head to the navigation, which I actually really, really love, to climbing the mast, which I also really love. I'm not afraid of heights. I am afraid of snakes. <laughs> so I'll take heights all day long over snakes. Um, to starting the dinghy, to understanding the electrical system, to doing the plumbing, to I'm terrible cook, but I know how all the stuff works in the galley and that kind of thing. So um, the, that, that's, that was important to me as, as the person in charge of the boat to really know the boat as best as I possibly could. I didn't expect myself to be the expert at all things or like fix the diesel engine, but I did need to understand what the alarms meant and how to do the basic stuff. Um, and and when I, I found that by doing that, when things went wrong and it's not an if, it's a when, I had a lot more tools to help me handle issues and the ability i'm generally calm under pressure but I, it's probably mostly because i have studied the thing and i at least have some ideas of what to do so um i'll kind of start a little wrap up with two things i'm really proud of and feel really lucky about that has to do with by being a captain in the boat and one is that I get to do expedition science i feel like expedition science is also a blending of all of my loves and uh, these are some of what we did. Um, these are the activities that we did. We sampled the whole Hudson River from Lake Tier of the Clouds where the Hudson starts to Ambrose Light where the Hudson ends. And I, I never really thought like I thought about it before, but knowing a whole river from where it starts to where it ends, basically traveling nearly all of it is a pretty cool thing. And we took samples every three miles to look for microplastics in the air. So uh, we did that when we were on American Promise, which we were able to do for the bottom half of the Hudson. So from Ambrose to Albany, New York, uh, we had a air pump up the mast, I'm taking it down. So not posed. I just happened to be having the same posture as Statue of Liberty there. Um, we tested the soil for microplastics, and then we used buckets to test the surface. That's right there at Ambrose Light. We tested the midwater column and just above the seafloor. I don't know if you guys have used a Niskin bottle. It's a very clever mechanical device to help you only collect water from a certain depth. And we even had a partnership program to, to look for the tiniest, littlest bits of microplastic. Um, and this is how I got involved with Nat Geo. So it was very specifically this work that got me the amazing honor to be a National Geographic Explorer. Um, is, is this work, this boat-based science and conservation work. 
The second thing that I'm really proud of is what we've done with the boat as far as hopefully being a resource and a lead in lowering footprint. So we put solar, wind, and hydropower on Promise. The solar, you know, the wind, you can see. The hydropower right now is out of the water. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's this thing right near like the A and the M in American on the transom. And that arm folds down into the water. There's a little propeller so that while we're sailing, we make enough power to power all of our instruments. So like an overnight sail, when we have the radar on and all the various navigation instruments, we don't have a net loss in power, which is pretty spectacular. And not only that, but we haven't turned on our generator or plugged into shore power to power our house bank, which is everything but propulsion, in eight years since we installed all this stuff. And that's, that's super exciting to me. So um, I have a little like, here's all my stuff, but I'm going to stop sharing and um, okay. And I think we can just sort of wrap, I'll wrap it up and save the rest for questions after Sydney speaks. But thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Okay, girls, if you want to grab pizza before I'll get Sydney all set up up here. I feel like you've lived one million times, Rachel. That's so awesome. It's all this piece.
you know, having sand under my feet. And so at a very young age, I knew I wanted to go into a career that had to do with water. Um, and I also loved animals. So for a long time, I thought I might become a veterinarian. And then when I realized how much I loved the water, I decided, you know, maybe marine biology or the environmental sciences is best for me. So I was actually a student here at Ness, like a very long time ago. Well, not a very long time ago, so not that old. But I was a student here at Ness from the time I was eight, so I'm 22 now, so pretty, pretty long time. And then I became an instructor. So I know I have some of you as my students in the summer, not Ellie, because I taught her sailing. Um, but Ness really inspired me to go into the marine science and it really piqued my interest. So that leads me to what I went, where I went for my undergraduate. So I'm still in college. Um, I'll touch upon that a little bit more, but I just graduated from Massachusetts Maritime Academy. Uh, some of you probably have no idea where this is. It's actually on the Cape. So um, in Massachusetts, that is our trading ship, the TS Kennedy. It's 700 feet long. Um, it houses around 800 people at full capacity. It's done a lot of relief work um, when some of the major hurricanes like Sandy hit um, and some of the other hurricanes down in the Caribbean, it's been all over. Um, so there's, it's called Sea Term. So we actually take this boat down. We'll take it down to the Panama Canal. We'll do shell back. So there's a lot of cool things going on. But yeah, so I graduated from Massachusetts Maritime Academy in 2021, which is very recent. Um, that was in May of 21. Um, and Massachusetts Maritime Academy is not a, it's not a military academy, although we do wear uniforms. Um, when you go there, you're, you don't have to go to, into the military, although a lot of us do decide to go into the military. I decided not to, um, but it's about 10% female. Um, so at times I was the only female in some of my classes. I lived on the same floor with 70 guys. I got <laughs> So just oh, so, so to put that picture. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that was disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so Massachusetts Maritime Academy, I had a great experience there, but I also wanted to just open your minds up to um, mar the maritime industry. Um, and it's a little bit different from what some of our other speakers today have talked about. Um, they're more educational at maritime, but the true, like true, 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 like maritime industry so shipping boats or working on shipping boats or you're going all over the world in those giant container ships that you see. Um, being a captain is a very small part. So you can go marine trans, transportation, and that's like working as the deck crew or getting your unlimited captain's license and driving these giant shipping containers. Or you can become a marine engineer. So you're actually working in the engine room on these boats, making sure they're running smoothly and not gonna break down. And that goes all the way from, you know, working on these big engines to like fix, fixing our refrigerator on the ship. Some of these ships are at sea for months. So you don't have an electrician on the boat. So if a refrigerator breaks down, you're gonna call your marine engineer up from the engine room to have them fix your refrigerator. Um, and then there's like energy systems and mechanical engineering. So these two are, these two are, are, are what we call licensed majors. So you actually get a license from the United States Coast Guard when you get out, okay? These are all licensed majors, so you won't get a license from the United States Coast Guard when you, when you graduate. Um, and these have to do with energy power plants to so be working onshore. Um, some people go the nuclear route and they work on nuclear submarines. I have some friends that are working on nuclear submarines for the Navy right now. Um, and then my major was uh, MSSEP, so that was Marine Science Safety and Environmental Protection, so I'll, call it, I'll touch on that more. And then Emergency Management, so that was like firefighting, EMT, um, waste, man waste ha hazardous waste management. And then the other end of it is kind of more administrative, and that's maritime business. So all of these companies, how are they being run? And those are all, that has all to do with maritime business. Um, which is really cool. So yeah, I graduated with a bachelor's in, of science in marine safety science and environmental protection. So my major was a lot to do with obviously marine science, but also safety and, uh, and environmental health. 
So it was kind of split between, I took like a lot of um, marine biology oceanography courses, and then I took a lot of uh, hazardous waste management, chemistry courses, how to deal with oil spills, how to deal with um, bloodborne illnesses, and kind of more of the health side of things. So as you can see, this, my, this is me graduating in my uniform. Um, these are our formal uniforms. You don't wear these all day. So we were like this over here. So we have a belt, look very military with our covers on. And then I was also on the sailing team there. So like I said, I grew up sailing in this area. I grew up in Ness basically. So um, this is me and my skipper, Frank, who works up at the Great Lakes right now. And we were sailing against Brown, MIT, um, Tufts. So we sailed against all the other colleges in the Northeast, which was really cool. Oh, and then I also got my minor in marine biology. That was a lot of fun. That had more to do with animals rather than health and safety. So see, there's, these are some of the certifications and licenses I have. So I have my OUPV six pack, which is like a step above um, the uh, like shuttling. Launch, yeah, launch, launch driver. driver, sorry. It's like a step above launch driver. So I can take, legally, I can take six people plus a crew with me. Um, and then I have my oil spills first responder training. So if there's ever an oil spill, I'd be able to respond to it. I'd be able to clean up the oil spill, help do um, organization and administrative things. Um, so anything that has to do with oil spills, I'm trained in that. I also got my open water dive certification um, in South Africa. And I'll touch more upon South Africa in a little bit. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. Highly recommend that. And then this one is um, OSHA 40 cert, 40 hour certification. So if you ever go into health and safety, which I recommend if you're into health and safety, safety, there are a lot of jobs out there, especially in the maritime industry for health and safety. Um, and that's my OSHA 40 cert. So we're in full hazard gear. So if there's ever like a chemical spill, you have to get in this and clean it up basically. So my experiential learning and studying abroad programs. So I went to Bermuda. This was when I was at Mass Maritime. This is, this is me snorkeling with um, some of my other friends. Um, and we spent about 10 to 12 days down there doing a working field guide on um, snorkeling, looking at all the reefs over there. It was a really cool opportunity. I absolutely loved it. We stayed at BIOS, which is Bermuda's Institute of Oceanography. Um, so if you ever study in Bermuda, you probably will go and see BIOS. It's a really cool facility. They have a, they have a research vessel there that we were able to tour. That was a lot of fun. I learned a lot about Bermuda. They have a really pristine um, coastline because it's so well protected. But they're an island, so it's easy for them to protect it. And then South Africa. I was able to go to South Africa. In there, I um, studied great white sharks. So for a month, I studied great white sharks down in South Africa. Um, I also studied other benthic organisms like skates and rays and other small sharks. Um, and then I also did um, my open water dive cert. And I also got my marine mammal stranding certification. So this picture in the middle, this is a dead pygmy sperm whale. Um, if you ever go into the sciences, especially the marine sciences, you might have to deal with situations like this. Um, so we actually ended up doing a full necropsy on this, this beached or stranded pygmy sperm whale that unfortunately had passed away. Um, and then you can't see it here. Maybe if I move it, but there it is a 16 foot great white shark. So, um, that was my main study down there. I studied them. Um, I was able to see them right up close to the boat, which is really cool. We were tagging them um, and studying some of their behaviors down there. And then that brings me to my next big project that I've done in my life was the fishery monitoring of Buzzards Bay and the greater Northeast coastline. And this has more to do with the captain's license that I have. Um, so this was my senior project at Mass Maritime. We were studying lobsters and we were studying local um, fisher, fish, such as this is a black sea bass and this is a tatab. 
and you're measuring them and you're looking at their population density. Um, and then you can actually see there's a tag poking out of the lobster. So our job was to tag these lobsters and to also study shell disease. So shell disease is a uh, zo zoonotic bacteria that eats away at the lobster shells. Um, and that has to do with from like sewage runoff from pipes that aren't regulated. Um, so unfortunately, this is a, a very, very big issue right now, especially for the lobster industry um, in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, which is a $4 million uh, industry. So um, the research we're doing with this was all of our research was going back to the state for that. But we had to go out, out on a boat, and I guess we got to captain the boat. I did, because I have my captain's license. And the school recognized my captain's license, and we were able to go out and do this, which was really great. So right now, I'm still at university. Right now, I'm attending the University of Rhode Island, and I'm in the College of Environmental and Life Sciences. And I'll be graduating, actually, next winter. Um, so right now I'm getting my master's in environmental science and management. It's called MESM. Uh, my track is in wetland watershed and ecosystem science. And I'm also getting my graduate certificate in aquaculture and fisheries. Um, so really my main focus is aquaculture and fisheries, but my track is in wetland watershed and ecosystem science. And that's really important because I need to understand where is the pollution source. And a lot of the pollution is going into our estuaries affecting our aquacultures and fisheries are coming from our wetlands and our watersheds. Um, so it's kind of this full circle um, study. I'm also working for the University of Rhode Island as a intern. Um, I'm working at our Coastal Resources Center and I'm working on um, projects for the state right now through their aquaculture and fisheries management um, uh, unit, which is really cool. So Rhode Island has a $6.6 .6 million shellfish industry. So I'm working on projects that have to do with that industry. Now, how does my captain's license relate to this? I'm working with a lot of salty fishermen, a lot of people that <laughs> have been in the business for a long time. And they're looking at me and they're going, what does this small, small girl have to tell me about the industry? And little do they know, I have a lot of experience, not only in this industry, but on the water. Um, so that just really goes to show you never judge a book by its cover. Um, but like I said, once I start talking, you know, once I tell them I have my captain's license, I have all this experience, I've graduated from a maritime academy, they respect me a little bit more in what I have to say. Um, so that's my current project. So yeah, aquaculture and fisheries management. It's really cool. There's some oysters here. I personally don't like to eat them. I think they're gross and I think they taste like salty gummy bears. Um, <laughs> but it's a really important, it's a really important industry to protect and to manage. Um, and like I said, I, I work with a lot of salty fishermen. These guys have been on the water for 50 plus years and they want nothing to do with me and they don't want to hear from me. But like I said, to bridge that gap and say, you know, I have this experience in the water. I have this license. Um, it does bridge that gap and that communication barrier between them, especially when we're setting up curriculum for training for entry level fishermen, which is going on in Rhode Island now. And I'm helping with some of that curriculum. And a lot of it has to do with safety on the water, especially health and safety and crew safety, which I have a lot of knowledge in being from Maritime Academy. Um, I went through all that crew training, I went through, you know, marine firefighting, you know, how to fight a fire on a boat. I went through um, cold water training. So getting in those big Gumby suits when it's, you know, minus zero degrees out and you have to jump in the water and get in these life-saving suits that's gonna make sure your core temperature stays up. Um, uh, I went through uh, lifeboat safety training. So we actually got in lifeboats and we're driving them around and, that was really cool, but I have all this experience and um, it really, it really pays for this industry, especially. Um, and especially when you're going into the maritime industry, it's a hard industry to get into, especially as a woman. Um, and I'm a, like, I'm a minority within a minority because not only am I a woman, but I'm also, uh, I mean, I'm Asian and at Mass Maritime and in the maritime industry, it's mostly white men. Um, and there's very, very few um, 
Asian women in the maritime industry in America. Um, so, you know, just thinking about that going further, like I said, any and anyone can be a captain. You can get your OUPV six pack right now. Um, and you don't need to go into it as a career. If you want to have it, some something have just like extra, that's also great. I chose it as a career and I absolutely loved it. But if you want to be an artist and you still want to be on the water and connect on the water, you can most certainly do that. There's no limitations to it. So yeah. Anyone have any questions? <laughs> Thanks. I see something in the chat. I'm curious, what is it? Uh, ah, Mary, so proud of your all your achievements and your drive. Yeah, I love it. So Mary's also, um, she was one of my mentors, one of my biggest female mentors. Um, and she was uh, one of my instructors for a very long time here at NASS. And then also, again, my supervisor when I became an instructor. So she's played a really big role in me going the path that I've been going. <laughs> I know that um, Beth or Sassy, who's another um, educator here at NASS, she's watching this and she said also Mary was a mentor for her at NASS. Mary's been a mentor for me. So it's, it's really cool that to create this network of people um, to have mentors, right? To have someone that you can talk to and learn, learn their life path and kind of glean a little bit of advice from them. I know listening to Mary, listening to Rachel, listening to Liz, listening to Sydney, um, got a little bit of advice for myself too. So never too old to learn something from someone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anyone have any questions about the maritime industry, how to get into it, you know? What do you think that you might be doing in a few years? Because I know some of you are in high school and college is not that far away. Trust me. Stop reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I graduated high school in 2017. So I, you know, it's only been five years for me, which is, seems far away, but it really is not far away. <laughs> How do you like, like, how do you know what you like? Did you always want to do this or did you like try something else and then realize it wasn't for you and then go into this? Yeah, so I, there was a point in my life, I really wanted to go, I knew I loved the ocean. I wanted to do something in the ocean. And actually for a very long time, I thought I was going to go into the United States Coast Guard and serve my country. Um, and I chose that that wasn't the best path for me, that I really wanted to get more into, um, the research side of things and so and now even now I realize I don't want to go into the research side of things because you have to write a thesis and a dissertation and that's a lot of work um but yeah so it, it definitely changed for me because I was really gung-ho I was very close actually to going to to the Coast Guard Academy very very close at the last second I was like nope I decided I want to go to Mass in time and um even then I thought I wanted to go into marine biology. Um, and unfortunately, like marine biology is a great study. Unfortunately, it doesn't make a lot of money. <laughs> um, and if you wanna become a marine biologist, that's great. But usually you're going to the research side of things. So you're going on and getting your doctorate and that's not something that I wanted to do. And so my path now is more into policy and communication. Um, and which is really cool. There's a lot of aspects in the environmental science. It's not just research. It has a lot to do with, like I said, policy and communication and bridging that gap between science and stakeholders. Communication is super, super important, especially in sciences. Um, and that's what, definitely what I learned in South Africa because South Africa is very different. It's not like the United States. And there's a lot of superstition around science in the community. And so to be able to, you know, tell them don't hunt the sharks or, you know, this is a better way to manage your fisheries or um, don't shoot the whales because they got caught or tangled in your fishing gear um, because they will do that. They'll, you know, if a whale is caught instead of calling someone to help and detangle the whale, they'll just shoot them, which is really unfortunate. 
So in that picture, you could see I was kind of cleaning the whale off and that was actually to see if there were any bullet holes in the whale and to see if it was a, if it was a case of shooting, mm -hmm. um, which is really sad, uh, but that's just life. You go to these places and it's a different culture over there. It's a different reality. Um, and even then I still thought I wanted to go into marine biology, but I realized communication is super important and to go into the communication and the policy side of environmental science was really more my route, really want more what I wanted to do. So that's why I'm working for the state right now. Yeah. Were there any courses or classes you took in high school, like related to this? That... Yeah, kind of. Um, and I actually, I, <laughs> I think about this a lot because I went to Westerly High School. That's where I graduated from. Um, I'm, so I grew up in Westerly, Rhode Island. Um, and they didn't have, unfortunately, I took environmental sciences, but they're, I'm gonna criticize Westerly High School for a little bit here, but they didn't have a lot of courses geared towards the environmental science. So I took as many, I took a lot of AP courses had it having to do with um, like AP writing courses because that's really important. Even though if you don't really like writing, then I'm sorry, but having really good writing skills is really important in science, especially if you have to write a research paper or if you have to write uh, a research essay, that's super important. It's gonna make your life a whole lot easier too in life is if you find your group and, and become kind of a good writer, especially if you're gonna email your colleagues um, you don't want spelling mistakes and stuff, right? But they didn't have a lot of courses geared towards uh, the environmental sciences specifically, which is kind of a shame because they, I live so close to the ocean. So I took a lot of uh, AP chem classes. I took AP biology, um, more of the heavy duty science side of things, um, which kind of prepared me, but not really. Um, but that was just the high school in general. So if you have classes that are geared towards kind of, you know, environmental science or heavily science-based, then that's great. Um, my high school just did it, so I was kind of thrown into the walls when I went to college, um, and I had to really learn quickly. There was kind of a big learning gap that I had to that I had to go through. I have something to add to that, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I want to second the writing part of that. Just thinking about what would make you valuable to organizations that are doing work that you want to be part of. Um, having well-developed writing skills and being able to write something in a reasonable amount of time, you know, so without it taking a very, very long time is a is a particularly valuable skill in particular to nonprofits. And the other is statistics. So this is a very like fundamental piece that what I, I don't know if you can take it in high school these days. I my high school didn't have it, but um, if you there are some just like these pieces of skill that will go a long way in again making you valuable as part of a team without an advanced degree and that kind of thing but uh, i think statistics is one of them because it bridges uh the communication side and the data analysis side of science to be able to actually talk about it uh, with authority and to help the people around you understand the data that are being collected in a, a robust and appropriate way. I know that for Rosalia Project, we truly value people who have statistics so that we can have that work done in-house without me having to go find other partners to do that work. And then one more thing I don't want to forget to say, just something I had written down during the questions of, before pizza, uh, is that internships, in my opinion, internships get you jobs at the places that you want to be working i know that for rosalia project in the last 11 years we have nearly always hired from within and within has only been interns effectively so uh, we've just hired like one of our first real well-paid positions and it was someone who was an intern when she was in college 
Uh, she's now our communications person. Uh, and, and that's been the experience that we've had, but also I've helped our interns get jobs at their dream places by helping them become an intern at those dream places first. So I, you know, if you can swing internships, even short ones, uh, in my opinion, especially in the NGO kind of world, uh, it's a great path in. Yeah, just to echo what Rachel was saying, um, even now in high school, there are some internships that you could probably find, but now networking is extremely important. And you guys are really well off right now because what you're doing is kind of a part of that networking as well. Um, and it's so important for when you're looking for internships and when you're looking for jobs um, and just to have that strong networking background is really, really important. I want to just mention too that don't underestimate the value of some unique hobby or some passion you have as well. So if you love art or you love croquet, I mean, it could be anything. Make sure that you allow yourself to share that because somebody, it just makes you a person instead of just a kind of check it off the list type of person. And then also like real work too. Like I worked in a deli. I like slaved in a deli. And that's something that on a resume, having a real job along the way of anything that demonstrates that you've worked with people and that you understand, you know, picking up a mop and understanding the systems of the boat, um, that really absolutely makes a difference to like just being a person who's capable. Mary, I had written as one of my other little messages is pursue your loves. Yeah. Exactly. The same thing is even if your loves are not feeling exactly like they fit into the <laughs> official feeling path, the reality is there's not really an official path and you do stand out by having loves, <laughs> the things that you love to do. I, I hired... I once hired this amazing woman from Kansas and she's like, and this is for an ocean based job. She's like, I've never seen the ocean. I've never touched the ocean. I love orcas. I want to move to your area because I love orcas so much and I want to work for you. And I just the, I mean, she had the background in the science from the books and the right classes. She didn't really have the personal experience that we needed but she had the drive and that came through in her love for orcas. And it's, it sounds silly, but it's very distinguishing when you're a person who's looking for somebody to be a part of a team. That's the truth. We had a, we had a woman come on board as an intern uh, volunteer crew once, and she was an accountant and she kept saying, I don't understand why I'm here, but she might've been an accountant, but she was the mother of two lobstermen. And she considered herself an environmentalist and she lived on an island that didn't have ferry service in the Gulf of Maine. And it was her perspective and her passion that made her a very important part of our crew for one of our expeditions. And you could argue she had done nothing that would you anybody would tick boxes off uh, to be as part of, of our crew like that. So you never know. Yeah, uh, what I'm seeing right now, especially in, in this field, is that employers aren't, so I just applied for a job, obviously, and I end up getting, employers aren't looking necessarily for um, your experience. I mean, they are, but they're also looking to see, like, are you, are you going to be a team player? Like, are you a good person? That's actually very valuable right now um, in the industry. And that's what people, employers are really looking for. Are you disciplined and multi, are you a multidisciplined person? So do you have not only knowledge and science, but communication, you know, just social skills in general, political, um, and it really does take all that. So it's not necessarily nowadays about honing into like one thing, but more just having kind of bits and pieces um, of multiple things is actually really, really useful right now. And we'll be free you when you get jobs, obviously, but they're still a little young, I guess. 
And like Mary and Rachel and Sid have all said, like, do chase the things that you love because you never know how you're going to connect with another person through that. Um, it just takes like a little connection. And that's really all a lot of jobs are looking for. Some jobs you need to be more qualified in certain areas than others, but like human connection and the ability to talk to that person and communicate with them. So the writing is really important. But sometimes it's it's like your your pet passions, things that are not related to the job at all. So don't forget that even in the job hunt and the career, the career track you might be on, like being a person is still super important. Um, and everybody's a human. Yeah, go. Yeah. So one thing that came to mind when you talked about classes is where I was in high school, some things weren't always on TV, like environmental science wasn't the thing. And so we, as a student body, found a community of kids who were excited and interested and stuff like that, and made our own clubs. So whether it be at your school or just the community of friends you have in the area, like you can take the initiative to follow your passions and do it your way as well. Building connections, coordinating with people, leading in different ways, those are all really great skills that you can put on your first resume whether it be through school or not. So it could be as goofy as like, I did an iron dance once, once like, what's that gonna do for me right now in my career? But I don't know, having a little bit of individuality and being able to bond with that in a group is, is really important and it shows a great level of initiative. Um, I'm excited to see you all here. I really think you just put in a I have a good example of an, an unexpected sort of connection. Um, so I don't know if you've listened to a podcast called How to Save a Planet. Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson used to do it. It's, it's really good. And she had a uh, way for people to figure out how they could make an impact. Uh, her, her, she's a marine biologist, but she was focused on climate change. And she had this Venn diagram for the planet. And I've been doing the same thing, but for the ocean. So a way to figure, to help narrow things is to first make a list of everything you love. I mean, everything, nothing, it doesn't have to be the ocean. It could be, but very specific, like things you love. Then make a list of things you're good at. And again, doesn't have to be related to anything, just the things you are good at. You might be a good talker. You might be a good writer. You might be great at introducing people. You may be able to walk very long distances without your feet hurting. There's a ton of different things you could do that you do. Everyone is good at a bunch of things. And then the third piece is to think about what the ocean or the planet or the third piece is like the sort of glue, what it needs. And ideally what it needs that you're interested in. And this list can be very long. Uh, you just, Sydney talked about policy and that kind of thing. The ocean needs to be understood. So there's some science, the ocean needs advocates, the ocean needs artists and people to communicate on its behalf. And then you kind of put it together and find the intersection. And like, for me, I could, I could give you an example. It's that I love swimming and sailing in a clean ocean. I am good at the front end of projects, like pushing things forward. And I knew a couple of years ago that the ocean needed less microfiber pollution. And so the center of that particular Venn diagram for me was the core ball. Um, so I have an example and that's say you are really um, good at knitting. Feels random knitting. And say you love penguins so much. Well, it turns out that while it wasn't obvious, there used to be a group who was doing peng penguin rescue and they put out a call because they needed penguin sweaters for the baby chicks who didn't have parent penguins to keep them warm. And so you look it up, the pictures are insanely, ridiculously cute. And so there's been a time when people who were really good at knitting and loved penguins were able to put those two together and have a tangible, measurable impact on a species in our ocean. And so I guess I wanted to share that story for reasons of embracing these things that make you unique and skills that you have and what drives you to be psyched about the day because you never know what an impact it can have. 
you could be making penguin sweaters. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. I definitely resonate that. And I also want to say, don't, don't let people tell you you can't do something. Uh, just like Mary, like my brothers told me I couldn't play baseball. And I was one of the best baseball players on our little league team. Um, and I think that's what really drives me today is that there are people out there that are going to doubt you and they're going to tell you you can't do it by the way you look or because of your gender or because of it, the area that you come from. And that's, that's not true. You can do really anything that you want to as long as you have, you know, hard work and drive. Um, and those are really the key elements to doing and to getting really anything that you want. <laughs> to, you know, surround yourself with people that empower you <coughs> to feel success in any environment. You know, it's one thing to take the initiative yourself and like you all are doing here and being part of this group community, but also, you know, surround yourself with like kind of people who are really empowering you and supporting your choices. Um, and also, you know, if you share some of your interests, you know, maybe this individual whoever you're sharing with you know, find another avenue for that to kind of channel that passion. Um, I think it's really important to, you know, have a very diverse group of friends and network in terms of interests, um, but also, you know, feel empowered by who you surround yourself with and allow them to really support you in your dream and your vision. And I think also from our last speaker series that was sort of touched on briefly this evening is that, you know, it's a path. And sometimes you get off your path, and sometimes you think this is your interest, and then you're doing something else, and then it's taking this other path, and that's okay. Um, you know, sitting here listening to all these amazing, accomplished women, you know, it's like I go home, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to get my life together. But then you realize, you know, everyone's doing a great job, and um, you know, everybody's on their own journey getting to what they want to do, and it's just personal satisfaction, and also making sure that. You know, you're believing in yourself and you're striving yourself to figure out who's believing in or support you in your grief, whatever that is, or professionally, personally. Um, so, definitely, you know, it's great that you all are here. This is your maiden. These are this is right here in the flesh. So, it's really, really powerful. Questions before we kind of wrap up and chat real quick about our spring calendar. Any final questions for the panel? If we don't have any questions, I'm going to ask Sid and Rachel the same question I asked Mary and Liz. Would it be okay for us to share? contact information of you both with our mavens if they have any questions or um, reaching out and for any reason. Yeah, please do. And in fact, I wanted to just put a plug in. Now, my guess is most of you are just below our minimum age, but to keep this in mind, our, our minimum age is 18 to volunteer on American Promise. But we are just about to put out our call for crew this summer to join us for a variety of expeditions from remote island cleanup to education based and uh, so we don't have so much hardcore science going on this summer, but some really cool uh, activities going on this and all summers, hopefully, that don't have pandemics in them, but uh, keep in touch at rosaliaproject.org and um, yeah, we bring people on from ages 18 and 71 is our oldest. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely share that information with everybody. That sounds so awesome. I know we do the Rosalia project here when we do our marine debris. And I didn't realize that was connected to you until you started talking. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> Yay! I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. But thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Sydney. Um, it was awesome to have you. We'll be in touch. Good luck, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.